Pranakosha live stream. Hey folks, it's Matt at Pranakasha Productions. Today we're talking with Bonnie Janofsky, who I met at a Zoom meeting uh, with Mark and Elaine Zickry a couple weeks ago. And now who might that be? Well, I know them from Space Command, Mark and Elaine Zickry, and, um, but they also have their fingers in quite a few different pies. So... Um, Let's just talk about it. So how did you meet Mark and Elaine? I met them back in 2000, and uh, I was working on a musical with someone, and they were a member of the table. Okay. They invited me. At that time, it was called the Hamptons Table. This was uh, Hamptons. 2000. The Hamptons was a, a small restaurant on Highland Avenue, just south of Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Oh, okay. And so... Uh, I mean, when it started, I guess it was probably, they started it, they said, this year is 30 years. So I met them in wow. 2000, 2001. It probably might have started, a, I think it started as a, a uh, writer's group. But yeah, everybody yeah. now, everybody's so been. The one I went to was, they were held, holding it at Denny's, right? Yes, it's been at yeah. Denny's. It's been at a number of different places. It was at um uh, some places in Burbank, North Hollywood is where they're meeting now. Okay. Uh, of course, during the pandemic, it, it went on to Zoom, and now it's hybrid. Yeah, now it's kind of both. And so this table, what it is, is um, it's just sort of an informal gathering of writers and producers and actors, I guess, too, that Composers, come together and share a uh, network and stuff like that. People from some more beginning, some very accomplished. Mark and Elaine, of course, have... Uh, written for Mark uh, is written for TV. Uh, uh, written a three um, a uh, novel, three uh, Magic right. Time, and of course working on Space Command uh, and the Twilight Zone amazing. stuff too. Yeah. I know that they said that they wanted to get a um, uh, community together to really bring people together in the music. I mean, sorry, in the entertainment industry, not specifically music, but yeah. in the entertainment industry. And uh, they've done that. I, I know I've worked with a number of the people on the table on different uh, productions, scored their projects, things like that. And um, yeah. Yeah. But so you, so your, your main thing is music, right? Yes. Uh -huh. I'm right. a composer, composer, ranger, songwriter. I've worked on film, TV, um, Lately, I'm doing a lot of musical theater, uh, big band jazz, a lot of different oh, things. Oh, cool. Mm hmm Wow. I'm a pianist and drummer, but mostly composer now. Did you say drummer? Yes. Ah. <laughs> yeah. I started on piano at nine years old, took up a little bit of percussion in uh, high school, and then took up drums in college. <laughs> and okay. Really, really uh, yeah, that, that just... Um, and when I started college, I signed up for the jazz band, and I hadn't improvised at all at that time. I didn't oh, wow. read chord symbols or improvise. And at first, I was playing the piano parts that were written out. But then okay. uh, when I got a chance to, then I got to play some vibes parts, thing, vibraphone. You know. um, right. But then I got to start with the drums, just took off with that. That just was so natural for me. Interesting. Wow. Okay. So, the, and your drum stuff was sort of jazz big band stuff, or were you like playing rock and roll and pop and stuff? I started out playing too? big band jazz. That was the fir very first drumming that I did. Uh, okay. I mean, later on, I did some rock drumming, and I've done different styles. I've played, for, I've either played piano or drums for musicals or big bands. I've some played piano, but I much prefer playing drums in big band. That's a lot more fun. Um, Interesting. Yeah, wow. I used to have my own big band also. A number of years ago, I had my own big band. Oh, so you were the conductor? Uh, from the drums. Mm -hmm. And gradually, I wrote, then I wrote more and more of the arrangements. Um, I was thinking about starting a big band, and then I ran into, uh, I met a woman who played in the big bands of the 1940s. Okay. She said to me she was planning to start an all-women big band, and at first, I, I wasn't sure. I didn't want a novelty, but 
Uh-huh. The two of us started uh, an all-women big band in 1979. Wow. And uh, then she left the band. I was on my own a while. And then I brought on a woman, Ann Patterson, and that's the band that became Maiden Voyage. Some people have heard of that big band, oh, cool. band Maiden Voyage. And then we went off separate ways. And every once in a while, I've done something big band, although I tended to do co-ed, not uh-huh. just make it all, all women. But uh, yeah, I love doing, love writing and playing big band. That's fun. So when you write big band stuff, do you use all those extra symbols like for shakes and slides and splats and stidoodles or whatever they are? I use use a a, a four-piece drum set. It's, of course, snare drum, bass drum, and then I have two toms, mounted a floor tom. And then I have uh, three ride cymbals, crash cymbal, and hi-hats. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Well, actually, I was talking about, like, I took a class in college. Uh, I can't even, you know, I think it was a jazz class. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where our teacher was ta- teaching us about how once um, the jazzers started writing stuff out, um, basically the big band stuff, where they actually mm-hmm. scored it out and had parts, then um, I think it was Duke Ellington was the one who started developing a whole bunch of uh, notation that would, you know, like like a shake, you know, when a trumpet's really high and it does, it's kind of a trill between two notes. I think that's called a shake. Uh, I mean, and I know. there was a symbol for that. Shake, yeah. I, oh, okay. When you said symbol, yeah. I was thinking drum symbols. No, symbol, I meant notation oh, yeah. oh, okay. symbols. Yeah, symbols with okay. an S. Yeah. <laughs> My brain went to symbols on drums. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, yeah, uh, Duke Ellington did a lot of very innovative things. You know, I don't know if he's the one that developed the symbols for those. That I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a really great question. Now I want to look yeah. at. That. I know it was one of those guys, or maybe they one of them started it, and then it probably started to evolve after that. But they're well, like, I'm trying I'm to think. Sure, though, what, probably what there are. There was a shake. Then there's the one. I think all it is is an up arrow where you tell the it's just just tell the trumpets oh, to screech like the highest <laughs> note they can do type of thing. I think there's something a doit. Let's see, is that the one doit? Uh, well, let's see. Yeah, something like that. Oh, that one. And then there's a fall off or, right. or of course this, all, you know, those. Done, so. all those things that you don't have in classical. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's okay. That's some cool. musicians some musicians I know are can play both classical. Right. And jazz and others can't. Uh, it's, um, I guess, well, yeah, more brass and woodwind, of course, for big bands, uh, right. for jazz. Uh, strings, are, I've known a couple um, violinists, for instance, that played really great jazz. Um, of course, right. not quite as common. My father. Yeah, they're pretty rare because. It's really, it's really rare to find a violin teacher that will teach you how to improvise. Overall, I would think yeah, it is. Okay, I mean, so I'm it's trying to way think more that. common in the brass or like no, guitar no teachers and stuff. I yeah, I think I only, I can only think of about two or three through the years who have really played really great. Uh, I mean, really improvised on violin. Yeah, I think of Bobby Bruce. I think did, and uh, there's another name. Um, there are a couple other people. Um, yeah, I mean, there are people that can do it. Yeah. And it's like anything. I mean, you got, well, well first you have to want to learn how to do it. Sure. And then after that, um, you hopefully find somebody that can tell you the basics of improv. Sure. Usually some kind of jazz teacher. And then, of course, it's like anything. You, you, start, cha- you start learning mm-hmm. how to do it. Um, sure. Sure. Like, I mean, I still rely on what I learned in college as a basis. And mm-hmm. then um, for a while, you just get used to just sort of f- free associating and just sort of doing mm-hmm. whatever. But then at some point, you start to realize, well, these guys that are really good, there's more to it than that. And they're, they're like, okay. they're sort of planning ahead or they have kind of a structure to it. Or like my thing that I do these days is I always... Once I do a, I'll, I improvise some kind of lick that sounds good, 
mm-hmm. in some song, whatever, then I'll try to uh, make a sequence out of it. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, and just re- I'll try to repeat exactly what I just did mm-hmm. again. Sure. And then um, maybe even three times. And then once you do that, it already gives it a whole bunch of integrity because we're used to hearing that in most music, we're repeating patterns and stuff. Sure. And then if you're really good <laughs> and you're able to get around that, you can sort of come back to that eight bars later and wrap it all up, you know, and make a really cool solo out of it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but um, that's the ideal. Usually you screw up somewhere and then you just have to sort of make your way back to where you started. You know, and even that can end up sounding really cool. Oh, yeah. Sometimes, uh, even composing, sometimes, you know, suddenly play something I'm like, oh, I hadn't thought of that, and that works. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. But just today, in fact, literally a half hour before I started struggling with the laptop to get this thing, our our interview going, I was I was working on the solo violin part for a piece that I'm writing. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be premiered on June 24th. Oh. And this, it's a full score plus solo violin. Wow. It's only half done. Oh and I was like, well, I've got like, I should have it. I really need to have it done like in a week or two to get the parts out for people to practice. And, and just a couple of days ago, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to pull this off. I'm just going to put it off a year. But then just today I said, you know what? I, I listened to what I had. I went through the score and I, I had it play it back in finale. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's my uh, well. long. <laughs> and I was like, well, this is really good. I should just really try to finish this mm-hmm. in time. So now I'm like, all right, get out the violin and just start improving and writing down whatever I'm improving, you know? Absolutely. And off we go. That, yeah. That's cool. So what's your instrument of choice then when you're composing? Is it piano or? Yeah, in fact, right in front of my uh, the uh, computer here, of course, I have uh, electronic keyboard. Well, oh, it's actually getting dark now, but right. acoustic piano over there. But I don't play that one that much, but I have a, a 88 key, a Kurzweil K1200 that oh, great. Um, yeah. play right in. And I've used Finale since version one on a very... I think very notationally. So I usually work in finale. Uh, I used to use digital performer and I've been gradually switching to lo- logic, but I don't I'm just, for me, some, the way I think and work, or if I'm writing, uh, composing something, uh-huh. I could play it into logic or whatever. Uh-huh. But I tend to transcribe right out of my mind and put it into notation. Just yeah, so do I. I tried um, doing the thing where you play it in the keyboard and then it notates it for you, but I found that too frustrating. Yeah, I mean, Finale yeah. has a number of different ways you can enter, but um, I mean, a lot of I'll, I'll think what I want, and then usually I'll step time play it in because I, I just don't want it so precise. <laughs> I'm just used to that. Um, you know, some people will learn to. Um, I mean, I learned to read music first, and it was later to. To develop and trust my ear, and mm-hmm. that's um, right. I've done a lot of transcriptions for people, and uh, more I let go, then I, I hear more and more. Um, right. Uh, so it's interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I came to composing kind of later. I mean, a little bit in college, uh, music instructor Danner in, in college suggested. Said, oh, you know the instruments of the jazz band. Why don't you write something for the jazz band? And actually, I changed to a music major. I always loved science and all, but I wasn't really the type of person to study a lot and all. <laughs> but um, and I took a music theory class and went, oh, you know, there was the piano teachers I had as a kid mostly just was just playing pieces. It wasn't. <laughs> Wasn't oh, really? getting into too much in, in the way of uh, music theory. Interesting. Wow, okay. a whole new world to discover. Really? I thought most piano teachers taught theory so that you could know chords and then be able to help you. That yeah. would help you sight read and chords and scales yes. and arpeggios and all that stuff. I know the first piano teacher that I had, I was nine and my brother was six. And there was a 
a teacher we went to his house and he sounded like he would be really interesting from the way he spoke and he said oh tap out rhythms and things I was just thinking about that the other day and he said he would take me but not my brother who was only six at the time and so my parents found a teacher that took both of us but I, I thought I, I don't know I would have been interesting to, um, yeah, study with someone who really did go into the music theory because I wasn't that aware of it until much later on. Uh, yeah. The world, yeah. The first time I took a music theory class, and part of the music theory class was ear training. It was like I was used to reading the music and all. Mm -hmm. I wasn't at that time, uh, just early years of college, used to playing by ear or hearing. That was a... Um, some people create songs or whatever, but I always, from the very beginning, has uh, yeah, learned to read music from the very first piano lesson. Um, Interesting. Do you have yeah. students now? Do you teach students? I haven't been. I've had a few students here and there, but I haven't done that much in the way of teaching. Um, I've done, in the past, I've done a number of like workshops on finale. Okay. For different uh, groups and all. You know, for American Society of Music Arrangers, Composers, and different groups that I would talk about Finale. Yeah. I think so, you've, I've used it we're talking months. stuff. So, guys, Finale. What Finale is the software that we use. Yeah. Okay, there's two main so pieces of software. There's Finale, and then there's Sibelius. And then there's another one now called, what's Dorico. it called? Dorico. Dorico. Dorico, yeah. People are yeah, starting I know. I haven't tried it. In fact, uh, I picked up a copy of it about a year ago and thought, oh, I should check it out because so many people are talking about it. And I'm so used to Finale. I realized the other day I haven't even opened the box or yeah. opened the file. <laughs> yeah, like uh, I'm I'm so pretty much finale. using Finale for the rest of my life. Because yeah. I mean, now I know how to use it, you know, so yeah, there's know no point well. in me trying to learn something new. Mm -hmm. When Finale began... It was very complex to learn. And of course, I was learning the computer and learning. I remember yeah. debating do I get Mac or PC? And, and I've always used Mac. About two years after I started to use Finale, then it came out on PC. It came out on Mac first. Oh, I know that. Yeah, it came out on Mac in the mid, well, late 80s. I mean, I got the finale on September 15, 1989. Oh, and wow, you're really 91 early. is when I saw people starting to use it on, on PCs. Oh, but I remember helping some people on it. And because they, they didn't, I, I don't remember exactly what year Windows began, but I remember going over to help someone on finale and um, for using articulations in finale on, on the PC, it was... I think four digit numbers they had to type in. It was very different, extremely yeah. different. Finale on Windows is not identical, but it's quite. It's pretty close now. It's pretty close, yeah. yeah uh, do you work on Mac or PC? Um, I work on PC, but just today I have a a, a friend who plays Indian ragas. He plays oh. um, he plays a sarod. He's really good at it. Uh, he used oh, to cool. take lessons from Ali Akbar Khan down at the Inst Ali Akbar Khan Institute in California. And anyways, um, and he would sit, I mean, he was like one of the disciples who would sit there every day mm -hmm. in these giant group classes, you know, for hours on end, learning how to play ragas in the tradition, traditional style. Anyways, he's he's now teaching me ragas and stuff. I do it. He right. demonstrates on, on Sarod and I play a violin. And the deal was we would do a trade where he mm -hmm. would teach me ragas mm -hmm. and then I would teach him how to use finale. Oh yeah. So, um, so I've been. Do I had a Zoom call with him today, and he has the the Mac version of Finale, and I yes. and I'm using the PC version, and we're just going through it, and it's almost identical. Yeah. Uh, there's a few little qu quirky things now mm -hmm. that we discovered, but mostly we both. I'm able to help him. It mm -hmm. Works out good. Anyway, well, we're talking, I mean, we're just talking about the most esoteric stuff that yeah. nobody's going to have any clue what we're talking about, unless That's they're a composer. True. But maybe let's talk about the musical part. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so are you, do you like wake up in the morning with melodies going through your head and stuff like that? Or how, how does it happen? You know, it depends. It depends what I'm working on. It depends. Uh... 
sometimes I know that if I'm starting to work on something, if I can get um, uh, just like the first, the first opening phrase, it's, it's getting past that totally blank page to get past, to uh, get like maybe the uh, first uh, phrase, then that helps. Then once I've started, yeah. <laughs> then off you go. Uh, yeah, so that, that helps. And then it depends. If I'm working on something that involves lyrics, I don't usually write my own lyrics. Uh, for instance, if I write musical theater, usually I'm working with someone who's usually in a two-person team. Oh, and interesting. Usually someone uh, else will write the book and the lyrics. I mean, sometimes you can work, work in three-person teams of mm. book writer, lyricist, composer. I like to see the lyrics first. Um, oh, okay. I think that... I think most of the composers I know prefer to see the lyrics first. Of course, mm -hmm. the lyricists, I don't know, they may prefer to hear, to hear some music first. But um, Yeah, I know. Um, I haven't wrote a whole lot of songs with lyrics in them, but I do, I've do. i written them both ways, where uh, the lyrics come first, and then the lyrics pretty much uh, dictate the rhythm. Mm -hmm. And then oh, yeah. I found it's pretty easy... To come up with some kind of melody, once you got the rhythm of the words and stuff, putting the pitches in mm -hmm. isn't really that hard. Mm -hmm. It really, it really helps. It's way better than having a blank slate. So mm -hmm. I, I've, I've been really successful starting with the lyrics, but I've also gone the other way where I have a nice melody and then they add lyrics to it. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then the, there's an in between where they both sort of go hand in hand. Now, do you, know, you usually write your own lyrics, or do you work with lyricists? All my stuff is my own lyrics, but oh. I mean, I've only written like ten songs. Ah. So, um, and none of them are well. Actually, one of them sort of could be sort of a Broadway type of song. Most of them are just sort of my weird version of pop. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And um, <clears throat> but it's so funny. Like, I had a friend. Um, was really into Bach cantatas. We were I when we created this Bach cantata society where we would. Oh wow, that sounds interesting. It was wow. fun, but we would get in these huge arguments hmm. because he would insist on singing them in English, and I was like, "No, they have to be in German because of the syllable, the sounds of the syllables, and all that was what Bach was writing in in German, and if it was in English with different words, he would have wrote different music to it. Interesting. But to this day, we still argue about it. <laughs> yep. Interesting. Do you so, still have that society? Um, it sort of fizzled a lot of. It was at a retirement home, and a lot of people uh, oh. either died or got too old to play. Oh. And then COVID hit, and of course that oh, destroyed the whole thing. That changed everything. But we are trying to get something going again. It's not a Bach cantata thing, but it's more like sort of a Sunday afternoon salon, oh. little informal recital thing we're starting to get happening again. Is that in person or on Zoom? In person, oh. yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's, it's spoiled yeah. by all the Zoom meetings. It's so easy to go to the computer and log on and then drive. Yeah, of course, I, yeah, I, you probably know. It's really hard to... Play music, with yeah. somebody over Zoom. Like That's it's true. possible there to do are... lessons where one person demonstrates and another person listens. Yeah. But if you both try to play at the same time, it just won't sync up. Yeah, okay. yeah. very much so. There's latency. Uh, yeah. I do know uh, during COVID, there were some people I knew were uh, we started to do some rehearsals online, and I know there were, were a couple programs that were mentioned. One was called Jamulus. And a couple others. And now I can't think of their names. But I knew somebody that had a big barbershop choir, and they were actually using Jamulus and rehearsing via Zoom. I know they're in Wow, person. rehearsing. Because well, I know uh, people, I know a choir director who he would basically have every person in his choir go sing the hymns at their house and send them uh, the files, and then he would oh, yeah. put it all together. Yes, that would and became very common during uh, COVID. If you're good at it, it would end up sounding really good. For one thing, it, it sounded way better than his choir usually would sound because ah. he would, of course, emphasize oh, the good it. singers yeah. and put the lesser singers kind of in the background, True. you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. The, um, um, 
I even have, have friends of mine that actually released big band albums that were done where each musician recorded separately. Yeah. And I know that for films, they're back to recording at the actual studios. Good. Uh, but the um, a lot of the musicians, they had to go out and they had to buy recording equipment, laptop mm -hmm. and uh, mics, all that. And they had to send in their parts. So then for a while, there was a premium they'd get paid, but they had to be their own engineer. And then the actual uh, audio engineers were, um, it was a lot of work for them because everybody, of course, recorded in their own. They all had different room ambience and all. It was quite, right. quite a project for them to put all those tracks together. Um, yeah. Yep. It's a lot. So it's yeah. Uh, yeah. So do you do um do you do do you get contracts to do any movie soundtracks in L.A. And stuff like that? I, do, I mean, I, I've worked on different films and sometimes done the music copying or orchestrating. As far as composing, I've mostly composed independent films. Okay, but um, yeah. Uh, so independent ones are usually lower budget, right? Uh, usually, but uh, it really varies. Yeah, it just totally varies. Um, yeah, they're all different budgets too. And I know a lot of people when they start out to do student films, or short films, things like that. But um, you know, because I was doing a lot of music play uh, years ago. I was playing like piano and drums and percussion, different groups, and then. As I began to got involved with uh, a couple of composer groups and all, and uh, then I um, so later on I took up more uh, uh, composing more full time, but uh, yeah, I mean I've done a number of different films, all different budgets, all different types uh, styles. Um, there's one particular filmmaker that I've done every single film he's done. When I went back to school and did the USC film scoring program, he was a film student at USC. His name is Mark Marcello and he's a tap dancer. So he's not a musician, but he has such a rhythmic sense. And okay. he writes all these intricate, you know, dance numbers and all. And, but it's really great because since he has a musical sense, he's able to describe it. It's a true collaboration. It's really fun to work with him. We really give each other ideas and all, and that's always fun. Um, yeah, and it varies. Some people, well, a lot of people will have some idea of what music they would like sometimes. Um, well, when they do early on with student films, they might not know, but yeah, most of the filmmakers will have an idea of what uh, style music they want. Mark particularly knows exactly like we're gonna, you know, this character is uh gonna be that different characters, like a lot of times themes for characters. Um that's always fun to do. Um I know sometimes I was thinking of a film. Actually I had a chance a number of years ago to do a film that was a uh a nineteen ah, I just forgot what year, nineteen seventeen? Nine uh I think it was nineteen seventeen. It was a um a silent film, oh, or 1919, I think it was. Uh, it was called uh, Hoodlum, and it was a Mary Pickford film. That was interesting because it was like an 87 minute film. <laughs> it was nonstop music. Okay. It's a silent of course, back film. Back then, oh my gosh. Yeah. A lot of times they'd just roll the projector and you'd have somebody improvise something on an organ right there on the spot. Yes. Now, this one. Yeah. Well, that's a good, I I don't think it had any. I don't think in the past that it, it had any sound. Yeah, I mean, of course, I worked with it with a, a, a copy of it that was, uh, of course, silent. But that's really something like, for instance, like a silent film because it, there's it's wall to wall music. I can right. only remember one place where I pop. I mean, I'm sure there were a couple places, but it was. Uh, it was pretty nonstop music. I, I think okay. at the time I had written, I realized I wrote like 83 minutes of music, something like that. It was, That's I mean, a huge project. Yeah. So that and was And it was just it. the music. You didn't write the sound effects too and stuff like that, right? No, I didn't do sound effects. In fact, okay. on that, let's see. Huh? Actually, when it, yeah, come to think of it, they still would be missing. 
See, they never added, yeah, they would be missing the sound effects though. Um, yeah, uh, on that one, yeah, I just did the music. And uh, yeah, wow, that was uh, interesting. Uh, that's very interesting to do, silent films. Very so interesting. Of all that, all that stuff, like what's your, what's your like ideal project these days that you, that you either are working on or you'd like to be working on? Yeah, well, let's see. Right now I'm working on a musical about a past president, <laughs> which is funny, <laughs> really funny. Um, and uh, I keep, keep thinking I want to do a big band again. Uh, uh -huh. I kind of get in doing other things. Um, now, would that be totally original stuff or would it be arrangements of classic jazz tunes or? Well, mostly original. Okay. Yeah, mostly original pieces when I'm working now with the big band. When I started my big band, I gradually did more and more writing. And now usually, usually it's all original. But um, I mean, you yeah, know, could do. How would you it. describe it? Like, what's your style? <clears throat> Is well, it... let's see. I love um, I love very I love melodic jazz. I mean, okay. certainly the improvising uh, is is part of it, but uh, I love what well, whatever I write, whether it's a film score, songs, I love writing memorable melodies. So okay. I, I, um, I mean, I love Sammy Nestico, things like that. Louis Belson, I remember him. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, just good swinging big band jazz. Sometimes um, I'll, I'll write uh, maybe uh, like to write some Latin tunes. And, oh, great! Yeah, like, yeah, have you written salsa tunes and stuff like that? Uh some. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay, I have to think back. What about you? Yeah. There were another yeah. one, one piece I wrote long ago that was I think I called it. Oh, what did I call it? Swing thing or something? Okay. Uh, just that. Will you turn on that light? It's gotten very dark. So, yeah, the sun went down. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Oh yes. Okay, that'll do. <laughs> and then there was light. into the darkness. <laughs> there we go. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, it was light when we started, but yeah. <laughs> um, Let there be light. Okay. Oh, I... <laughs> Let there be light, and then there was yes. light. Yeah. Let um, there be music. That's true. And then there was music. Oh, what was that song? Let, Let there be music. Something. Oh right. That's yeah, a hymn. I, I think that's a hymn. Let there be music. There was uh, also. Ba -da -ba -ba -da 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 -da. Yeah, I think there was a a, a song with that. Uh, the, well, we can make one up. Yeah, we can make up a song called "Let There Be Light" right now. Yeah. Let there be light mm -hmm. in the skies above. <laughs> Let there be light in my heart. And so on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, shoot, now we just derail ourselves. Ah. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say. So, like, when you write a re big band tune, uh -huh. um, do you just write lead sheets and chords, or do you score out the whole oh. thing? Oh yeah, score out completely. Okay. So yeah. every note's there on the page. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Now there might, in some places, for the rhythm section might be some chord changes and then of course chord changes if um if there's an an open solo an ad lib solo mm -hmm. but uh, the actual big band arrangement they're all notes are written out mm -hmm. okay yeah you know? i'm not super trained in jazz but i have a mm -hmm. um a small trio where sometimes we'll do jazz standards oh. and mm -hmm. most of the time we'll be reading off a piano score sure but sometimes we'll just have a lead sheet which is basically just the melody plus the chords Oh yeah. And the cellist That's has got to figure out a bass line and the rest of us just figure out mm -hmm. sort of inner voices and stuff and that can be fun. Now are you playing violin on that? Or or Yeah, in that group I play violin. Oh cool. um, but most of the time I play violin. Well, I shouldn't say that anymore. Because now I play cello too. Cool. Um but violin is the instrument that I have the most technique and oh, facility okay. in. So it's it's way easier for me to improvise on violin than on cello. I'll have to mm -hmm. say that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, let's see, yeah, a couple of violinists I've known who who yeah. improvise. I mean that really improvise very well. Yeah. Um, um how, do you know what have you, have you know what Shoro is? Have you heard of that? 
Choro? Choro. It's kind of a Brazilian jazz style. I don't, I don't know if I know that. I may have heard yeah. it. I, I just started doing that, that ring a bell. in the past year. Oh, and, S-H-O-R-O? Or? Um, yeah, at C-H-O-R-O. Choro. Oh. Oh. And um, I might have the book around here somewhere. Oh, you can look that up. Anyways, there's, it's, I mean, so you can buy books now. It's it's well established enough where there's a whole bunch of oh. standard Choro tunes. And you can buy these books, which are kind of like lead sheets. But what they do is in, they, they, they usually give you the melody, the chords, and then they also give you fragments of the bass line. Oh. It's a little different than your typical oh. jazz book. Sure. And um, and then what you do is people learn them, and then um, they improvise around them, and then there's a whole tradition around it. And um, it's a really rich. It's it's actually pretty hard to do because a lot of the songs have really wild chord progressions in them. They're not your usual ex- 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 ones you expect. So it, it's way harder, I find at least, to improvise over Shoro than it is to like well to do it over like a ja- a jazz or a blues tune. It's it's a lot easier. I just pulled um, up Shoro. Yeah, there's quite yeah. a bit about it. But yeah, wow, Brazilian. Yeah, if you go on YouTube oh. and just you and start and listen to Shoro players, yeah. they're they're really good. So um, it's a whole other subgenre. It's kind of like tangos. It's a little it, oh, a yeah, bit like I that. Love tangos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, anyway, there's so many great musical traditions, you know, that, that are so well developed that it's like, if you're a composer nowadays, you can just sort of dive into all these little subcategories and spend your whole life there. So that's fun. Well, okay. So you took, so you did take music theory. So it was mostly jazz. Like, did you ever do like, you know, tone rows and all that stuff? Oh, some. Uh, I did take also regular uh, orchestration classes. When I, anytime I t- took any kind of orchestration class, whether jazz orchestrating or or uh, uh, classical, I was always told that I had a knack for that. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Always, so that, uh, yeah. but, um, okay. But it sounds like you're pretty much a tonal composer who believes in melodies. And- tonal. I'm not really into um yeah i like the overall more tonal i mean if i'm doing like a horror film or something i may use um yeah i mean different different modern techniques styles and all. i haven't and really done uh like electronic type scores um that's um yeah i really like tonal well i mean overall tonal music um I haven't done a lot with, uh, uh, I mean, sometimes I've heard classical concerts where they're very, very, very atonal and very yeah. uh, electronic sounds or something. I, I don't know. That's just. Uh, Luckily, that stuff is passe now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, most composers are now writing stuff that the audience, um, it's oh. easier for the audience to relate to. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, there's still still avant-garde composers and stuff, but it's not like you have to do that. Otherwise, you're you're not a real composer type of thing. I remember (laughs) one class I was in in college, and an instructor at the time said, oh, you should change like that. What was some short piece? Um, I mean, it was early on, you know, uh, uh, maybe third, fourth year of college. But... um, and they said, "Oh yeah, you should change it and make this uh, whatever it was." And they they were saying, "Oh, make this uh, whatever dissonant or something." Uh, it just you know, and I'm thinking, for many years I didn't think about going into class, especially classical composition, because it just seemed like colleges and things. And it was all the very very avant garde, non yeah. atonal. I got so I, I well. I was like, if that's the way <laughs> composition is headed, but then later on I got. You know, interested in film, and then I got into um, musical theater, and right then you got stuff where areas. you have to write stuff that people can relate to. So it can't be just far out. True, know, 
Unless you're trying to write, I mean, if you're writing a sci-fi score, oh yeah, or that, something that, that's oh, supposed absolutely. to be really far out. Yeah, then, and that's then, great. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, if you, you want to write something that's or whatever rather than melodic, yeah. and things like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's true. Yeah. Um. Uh, um yeah, there, I mean, there was a time. I remember there was a time when the thing that got me was like. Um, Luckily, this is decades ago, but it seemed like mm -hmm. for a while there was a time where you couldn't write a beautiful melody with beautiful romantic harmonies sure. and have people take it seriously. So what composers would do, they'd write a beautiful melody, then they'd throw some crazy thing into it just to make it sound modern. Sure. And I was like, well, that's stupid. So they just ruined it because that's just what you have to do. That's the fad right now. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. If I'm going to write a piece like that, I'm just going to make it beautiful. I'm not going to just throw some junk into it to make it sound like a yeah. 20th century. Um, you Because know? <laughs> it's so easy. All you got to yeah. do is throw in a few wild chords or, mm -hmm. you know, or a couple yeah. of polyrhythms or something to just make it confusing to the ear. And then people think, sure. oh, it sounds modern. Cool. Sure. That's true. Yeah, all kinds of things now. I mean, <laughs> well, there are software and things or even every Mac comes with garage band or yeah a lot of people don't really know music that's the thing like I think about a lot of some of the young people have not had the experience of writing for live players I mean they can bring up and program anything they want but it's it's very different to have yeah a it's music player. music Lego I, music by Legos yeah <laughs> I know that when I write something in finale Somebody else it might bother, you know, it might sound computer like, but I know exactly what it's going to sound like. And yeah, I mean, and it sounds great. Like the live players, I mean, some people do synthesized scores. I know it was a couple of years ago when I was at a film festival. And oh, on that film festival, I was one of the judges. So that was a Burbank International Film Festival. It was the first year when they were just started adding music categories. But I was talking to this guy and I was saying, oh, it's just such a, the score sounded excellent. And then he said he did it synthesized. I don't remember his name or the name of the film at the time. I think it was actually, it might've been, a, actually it was a documentary, but it was very well done. But he told me it took months to do that, to program. I mean, to me, I just, I started out writing for live players before computer and, and you put the music in front of live players and they give so much to it. It's, if you've got good players. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the trick. Yeah, I know, yeah, really great players and yeah, yeah. so you're lucky, you're very fortunate. And, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, people they can just I mean the, the top well, player in LA will just sight read anything. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah, as well, we say they can sight read fly specs. I mean, yeah, excellent players and just um yeah, it's amazing. The, the people that do the studio work all the time, I mean, they're amazing sight readers and just, yeah, I mean, they have to. Or, yeah, right? I was talking to, um, quite a while ago, I was talking to Nami Melamod. Oh, yes. You know her? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So uh, she's. I've met, uh, I know of her and I think, I think I have met her. Yeah. Really nice. Yeah, I think she lives in nice. LA. You could probably go out to lunch with her or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So she's been writing all the scores for like Strange New Worlds and for uh -huh. Star Trek Prodigy, and they're super oh, good. Yeah. yeah. They're really good scores. I, I was I was like, wow, this is great. Yep. And then I, I managed to get an interview with her and sort of talk okay. shop about it. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah. So, and then she we talked a bit about the about the orchestra that records it. Mm-hmm. And she said basically what you said, which is like they they basically sight read it. Like they get like one or two tries and that's it. Oh, yeah. Because they have a limited budget. Mm -hmm. And it sounds perfect. You know, so these guys are really good musicians. And yeah. um, But surprisingly, you know what she told me? The orchestra, they skimp. This is Star Trek. And it's like their budget is at least $10 million per episode. Wow. But they were too cheap to hire a full... Um, a full brass section or and yeah. what What was it? They didn't even have a, a tuba, yeah. you know, and they had like three bases, no tuba. Yeah. Um, and what else? And I was like, man, if I was running that orchestra, I'd, I'd 
forget yeah. I'd, I'd get rid of one of the basses and get a tuba yeah you know to get that big brassy sound and yeah. she was like no we just have to figure out how to get the sound with less instruments wow and um so it wasn't even a full-size orchestra it was more kind of like a theater orchestra yeah and I was like, Fatuba, okay, you know, even if you're, the studio musicians, I think we're getting paid maybe 200 bucks an hour or something. Yeah, but it's I mean, like it a three-hour session. Yeah. So 600 bucks, they can't fork out 600 bucks for a tuba player? You would think, yeah. You know, for a show that's got a multi-million dollar budget. Oh so oh, anyways, happy. yeah. but I guess whoever crunches the numbers, you know, they got to yeah. save money somewhere. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing with films. Uh, hopefully, when people get to post production on their films, and they have re still have a budget for music. Yeah. And and I know that on different projects, sometimes I've come on way in the beginning, just reading a script, or you know, I've come on in all different periods of of the uh, production, uh, often before post production. Um, yeah. Um, hmm. Now, how fast are you? How fast can you whip out a score? I'm one of these people who I can come up with different ideas. Okay. Deadlines motivate me. Then I know I have to make decisions. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, actually, for me, it's, well, in some way, if I have too much time, I can think about it too much. For, I can mm -hmm. go quite uh, fast. There's a then I Then I know... Yeah, then I have to make choices quickly. I can, I can think, I can think through things too much. Uh, okay. But uh, I can go, yeah, produce quickly. No. Do you um, now when you like when you do a film score and stuff? Uh, do you have to give the rights to them, or like like could you make a CD? Or these days, I don't know what you call it. It's not a CD anymore. I guess yeah, it's an it's album. A, an album of like your. You know, your favorite 10 movies or some film scores you made or, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it depends. Usually so. Um, now, I know that um, um, you know, usually I'll have hopefully, the, hopefully usually to the rights to, to the music um, uh, but yeah, it's kind of to uh, release the soundtracks a, a little bit different. I mean, yeah, I know it's starting to get popular again. Like, yeah. I mean, like you can go get the soundtrack for The Expanse, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, which it's a bit problematic because what happens is people want to put clips of The Expanse on YouTube and oh, stuff. Yeah. Even I wanted to do it. Sure. And it'll have like the opening soundtrack in it. Oh, and yeah. then they'll get a copyright strike because the composer is like, really doesn't want his music um, out there like that, mm -hmm. which is, in my opinion, is a bad idea. I, what he should do is allow it to be out there so that more people hear it. Mm -hmm. But instead, what he wants to do um, is they want to get all the, basically they want people to go buy the soundtrack and listen to it there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're being such a stickler about any clips out there that use it so and then on, on uh, union sessions there then that's a separate use you know because there's film there's a right um yeah but so. unfortunately the thing is is that it's such a great opening theme for this expanse yeah that people really identify with it so if, if it would be allowed to be out there more people would it would it would pull more people in. That's true, and you know yeah. I wasn't thinking of that. I'd forgotten about that. There have been a couple of films, and I'm try I can't think of titles right now, but where they did release the soundtrack first and and uh, developed interest in the in the film and the project before the film came out. I, I can't recall yeah. titles now, but I remember being told uh, discussing with other other. Those are groups to yeah. think about. Well, I mean, it's certainly the case. I mean, there's a lot of shows where, like, the show and the soundtrack are, are totally wedded together. Of course, Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Obviously. Very much so. 
Um, you know, what's really interesting is, yes, there, and, and it's, especially in film, you know, I love memorable melodies and things, but of course I never want to cover dialogue or right. still you're working, supporting the film. Um, and, um, but the, uh, uh oh, I sort of forgot my thought. Wait, we'll get it back in a sec. Um, um, Depends yeah, on the director, of course. Yeah, that's Luckily, true. Luckily, Spielberg and obviously Spielberg and John Williams oh, had a yeah. thing going, so yep. there was a give and take, and there were plenty of moments in Star Wars where you could just go to town on the music, mm -hmm. and it totally worked. Very much so. Yeah, and it, it's funny, you know. I know when I'm thinking like, and I'm working on a, a film, something just a, a filmmaker will say, you know, just. A word or two even i mean it depends but uh okay we're gonna go here there whatever and um so i know that in um um but yeah that yeah a film there's that fine line of not wanting to to take away in any way uh or there's also in film where um if it ain't broke don't fix it i, I remember years ago i did the there was a famous uh earl hagen film scoring that was run at BMI, mm. and uh, that was one of the first things we learned. Sometimes the scene doesn't even need any music. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, uh, but you don't want to. Sometimes there's a lot of action going on, and that depends. I mean, like in a Star Trek or in some of the um, action films, there are a lot can be a lot of sound effects. Also, yeah. Um, if you write too much music, then maybe that it'll be. Uh, Pulled back so you can hear the sound effect. I mean, there's so many different right. variables that can come into play when you're working on film or, um, yeah. Here's another question for you. So, um, mm -hmm. what I've discovered too, like in uh, the stuff I do, um, like I used to think like when you're f scoring a film, mm -hmm. you got to write out the whole score and, and you're looking at the at the at the movie and you're making it all line up just like that and you're scoring it heavily or, or sparsely based on what's going on with the dialogue and all that but then what i realized um is and i don't know how often the the film score the composer does this but i mean you can easily just fade the music up and down as needed and That's then true. even fade yeah. in, fade in cues and fade them out, mm -hmm. you know, to get them all to line up in ways that, that maybe you never really scored, but you just, you know, fade it up and down as you, as you need to do it or take little fragments here and there as needed and just throw them in, you know, and that, is that typically, do you find, is the composer the one who's typically doing that, or is it somebody else after the fact that takes your stuff and then Usually, usually the first, up? when you first come on a film, usually there's what's called the spotting session. So you sit with the director and, and discuss or what music and also the in and out points. Um, so the first thing that I do, and most composers would do, I make timing notes uh, and at different frames, what's happening. I like to mark where all the cuts are. I won't necessarily be changing the music, but then, you know, when I first started to score a film, they were on, well, when I did Earl Hagen's class, it was just, um, yeah, we just watched the film and then his music editor gave us the notes and timing notes. But now, I mean, sometimes you have a music editor um, that most of the, most of posers, especially on independent films, mostly are doing our own um, editing notes and everything. Um, but the first thing I'll do is go through and make all kinds of timing notes that oh, this this action. Oh, but when I so when I first started, uh, and then um, so Earl Hagen's there wasn't any uh, video or anything. You could watch the film at the music editor's office and then you went home and wrote it by hand. Yeah. But then, of course, then it went to video. But now, I mean, because the film is also on the computer 
and it's digital. Uh, you could just scroll across and go any uh, anywhere in the film. It's so much right. easier. I think, oh my gosh, when you use cassettes or videotapes and you had to rewind. Now it's so great. I have my timing notes. I want to. I can go anywhere in a in a minute in a sec <laughs> to that space in the film. So of course it's different now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's. Um, yeah, what I've found like um, what I'll do some sometimes I'll use my own original music. A lot of times I'll uh -huh. use um. My stuff is mostly Star Trek stuff, so I'll use a lot of yeah. classic Star Trek music. Sure. Which, by the way, is super good. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to take it for granted when I was a kid watching it, but now when I go oh, back yeah. as a composer and listen to it, I'm like, wow, these guys are great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but then I'll also I'll, I'll throw in uh, just standard repertoire, you know, like Tchaikovsky or, or oh, Wagner yeah. or whatever, oh, yeah. and I can just take dramatic moments from there and, and plop them in, and they work great. Yeah. You know, if you if you know where to put it, yeah. You know, and how to use it sure. right, and if you well, if you time it well, it can be super effective. Mm -hmm. You know. And now it's yeah. I mean, in olden days or whatever, of course, uh, all the cameras, everything were just exorbitantly expensive, and now there's uh, definitely more opportunity for me people to make uh, independent films. You hear about people making films on iPhones, and all kinds of things. It's yeah. It, it changes and yeah, keeping up um, things, uh, the change is, uh, yeah, constant change uh, yeah. in the software think, we're all, yeah. The, the fact that we now have, that we can do all the editing using software yeah. and all the oh, yeah. effects, you know. Oh, absolutely. That as long Very as you know much. what you're doing and you have a good idea of how to use it, huh? you can make something that looks totally pro oh, yes. for almost zero absolutely. money once you pay for the software. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty uh, amazing. Some of the software is not even that expensive. I know that there are, uh, of course, we both use Finale. I mean, I've heard yeah. about programs that you can use for free. I mean, even notation. Yeah. But, um, I use Finale and I use Premiere Pro for my editing, which is, ah. I mean, you can, I think I'm paying 30 bucks a month or something. Oh, yeah. That gives me a whole suite of Adobe mm. products, including Premiere Pro. Oh, yeah. Because Final Cut, though. I guess, is only for Mac. Final Cut, I forgot if Final I can't remember right now. Does Final Cut run on PC? I, think I don't know. Uh, pro I, I've i never used it, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I think um, well, now that I think of it, when I hear Final Cut, I think they usually talk about Mac. And Premiere yeah. I know it's, it's very uh, popular, really great on, on PC. It's great. It Final still Cut. has some really annoying bugs in it. Oh, really? Oh. But... Um, like, okay, I'm going to go on a quick rant. There's so many, I mean, we're so deep into Premiere Pro and they're always putting out new versions of it. Mm. But it still has this damn bug with the video cards. Oh. Or with certain video cards, which happens to be the ones that I have on my oh. powered laptop, oh. it'll give you garbage frames. Oh. And there's no that way to fix it except to render it on some other machine oh. or just hope. And it's all random. You can never predict when it's about to get, give you a garbage frame. <laughs> and so sometimes you just you just tweak it a little bit and then hope for the best when you're yeah. rendering it. Sure. And but still. Oh man, now that would be frustrating. Uh, yeah. What do they say? Computers, we can't live with them without them. We can't live with. Can't live with them. You can't. Yeah, live they could be them, yeah. one little bug can just. Ooh. Uh, yeah, or the other one that luckily this hasn't happened to me too many times that I've heard horror stories where people are they're all done right and they're rendering the project and it's going to take a couple hours yeah. and halfway through it crashes uh -huh. and it's some weird error and they can't figure out why uh -huh. it did it so then they, they tweak it try again and then it crashes again and you know and they got a deadline you know it's supposed to be back they got a, it's supposed to be out the door like in there when you're worrying about getting they're tearing their hair out because it won't render uh, you know and, yeah anyway but i remember when i first started <laughs> to do like transcriptions for people and they had to give you the cassette and i mean i i knew Composers that uh, years ago did transcriptions from LPs and all, and then they did transcriptions from cassette. But now it's so cool. Even doing transcribing music, I can take the MP3, okay. see the waveform, and I have a program called Transcribe that I can visually mark where every bar, I could have every beat. I mean, 
Yeah. I think for me, I can do that. Great. I can go to uh, go to any any place on the uh, MP3 or or uh, Yeah, you can do that in Finale now. Oh, uh, to a certain extent. Well, let's see. Finale can put in you can have one audio file in a Finale file. I find it more cumbersome though as far as um I know I've done it. I did I did that exact thing where a buddy of mine Mm-hmm. wrote this rock song and i told him i'd or i'd add some orchestras stuff on top of it ah. and so i just imported the wave file of his three minute song yeah. mm-hmm. and synced it up so that ah. the bars would hit at the proper spot and then i started scoring and then i just had finale play it back mm-hmm. synced up and gave it to him and it sounded great i, yeah, used, I was I using note performer i don't know if you know what oh, that yeah. is yes uh-huh. and it came I out also- great yeah, no performer's great. Yeah. Um, I know that, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, Finale, sometimes I find there's maybe, well, no performer, there's a, about an, I think it's an eight second delay. At least it was. Uh, they just came out, I heard, I haven't tried it, but I, I just heard they came out with no performer four. I just heard that about a week or two ago. And I meant to check it out. Um but I know finale sometimes, yeah, sometimes, yeah, sometimes it, it seemed, uh, well, especially if there were any tempo changes or anything, um, sometimes I, I didn't find it as easy to totally sync the um, the audio and, and the um, finale file. But one yeah. thing is that finale starting in 2007, and I remember it, in fact, because that's when I was doing the Mary Pickford film. And it was like, wow, it was so cool because of the first time 2007, I always remember had some big changes in finale. It was the first time you could do linked parts instead of right. each part being a separate extract. That yeah. was huge. And then also 2007 <laughs> is when you could sync video and finale. Oh, cool. But I've during never even the tried pandemic, that. I, huh. I, you know, wasn't doing as much. And then I go to do a film and, you can't do that anymore in finale. I'm like, <laughs> so it, you, it synced with the codes, whatever they're called, the time codes. Yes, it, it would yeah. sync. Um, it, it used a little bit different instead of. Um, let's see. It used well, yeah. It would it would use the uh, time code, and it would work. But of course, with finale, you can only have whole number tempos. You can't do like in Logic or Performer. You can do point. Uh, you know, really. Uh, 2.873 beats. Oh, yeah. Side. I mean, you can do, yeah, any, any, uh, um, a much more, a small grad, grad, gradation, 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 yeah, of the like the tempos or, um, so as a couple of people showed me how I could, at that time, I was still using digital performer and then I could sync them up, but I had to, you had to hit play on the performer and play, and I was like, uh, I, I miss that. I really, I really like seeing the, the music and the, and the film together. Um, it's the way I'm so used to working in finale on everything, including. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I start finale for most everything. Um, oh, that's wild! I heard that Logic um, it syncs to film, and so far in trying it, I. I yeah, I like it better. There seem, um, uh, yeah, I'm finding things. But then I'll go weeks or periods where I don't use logic again, and then I have to okay, go back and remember. But finale, I use like hardly ever skip a day using finale. I'm working on something in finale almost almost every single day. Yeah, for that's these fun. decades. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to keep track of all that stuff. I, I assume you put dates on all your all your compositions and stuff like that. Sure, I'll keep uh, yeah, dates or version numbers. Well, if it's uh, songs or in musicals, uh, I'll have uh, yeah version numbers. Yeah. And then, uh, do you are you your own librarian, or do you have somebody else that's keeping track of all this stuff? Usually, I'm my own librarian. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's cool. And sometimes I help other people. Uh, used to do that a lot. I guess mostly I've been doing more of my own projects, but um, yeah. So for, people and that's great orchestrating or transcribing or copying or something and Even then you play in a rock band too right 
Uh, sorry? You play in a rock band now too, right? No, not now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I know a composer who does. Oh. He's a complete, he's, he, he's a classical composer and oh. he's quite successful. He's got, he's had several European or orchestras play his piece. He's oh, had wow. some really oh. good classical pianists play his stuff. And then he told me, like, he also plays keyboards in a rock band oh, how <laughs> and sings. <funny. laughs> oh, wow. And he can play bass, too, if needed, and so on. Cool. And he's, like, you know, in his 60s. I think he's, like, 63 ah. or 64. Really interesting. Your kids? Or it's probably somebody else. No, he's a bachelor. Ah. Not really. So he's, he's, he's got lots of time on his hands, but he, ah. he uses it all up. Yep. And he's, Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes I've known musicians. There was a fellow I knew named Marl Young. Um, he passed away back in 2009, 2009, it's 92. Oh my gosh, he was just amazing. Marl Young was, well, he was the first black music director in TV on um, the uh, Lucy show. He started playing in the, um, uh, Warm up band for the, I think for the I Love Lucy. If I, I love Lucy, okay, yeah. And then, um, and uh, but I remember him telling me like he played piano at a church on Sundays, and then he wrote music for the Lucy show, and he played this. Uh, he did so many different things, and he had written a lot of jazz. He he could play jazz. He could play classical. He just amazing, and he also became the first. Black officer of local forty-seven years ago, secretary secretary for many years. Right, uh, so I assume uh, that's the musicians' union. Yeah, local forty-seven is the Los Angeles local of the musicians' union. Okay. Ah, that's the shirt. Finally. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I happen to be <laughs> wearing the local forty-seven okay. shirt. Yep, yep. Cool. This, that, this is the local forty-seven. I, I've been on the board of local forty-seven for twenty-one years. So. Wow. Okay way back cool. and then i'm on the board of american study music rangers composers academy of scoring arts theater musicians okay uh well we should wrap it up soon but let's talk a tiny bit about the union so um uh do you ever find it i i know the whole point of being in the union of course is to to improve the lives of the musicians and the composers and everybody sure. right mm -hmm. um do you ever find where where it it backfires and it, it makes it harder for people to get gigs if they're union well, hopefully that um, to make the like contracts easier to uh, uh, to file. Uh, we have a uh, local forty seven. They have uh, good staff there now. They have really good uh, business reps and all that can help with like filing of contracts and things like that. Uh -huh. uh, ideally, when um, yeah, when uh, jobs are union, then the um, not only the uh, pay, but the uh, back end that they get, residuals, things like that. Um, yeah, there are, uh, you can meet, well, it's interesting in the big band musicians, they have rehearsal rooms there and you can many days, it's a little bit, it's still, now it's coming back, but before, especially before COVID, you could go down to the big, to the uh, union building and hear great players rehearsing different big bands um and things like that but um yeah the well, i know i mean there's always some give and take because i know like for a yeah. while a lot and i don't know if this is still the case there were a lot of uh movie 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 productions that were doing their soundtracks like up in vancouver canada rather than in la mm -hmm. because it was cheaper to do it up there yeah. So there was a case where it sort of backfired and people were losing gigs, right? Yeah. There are s certain signatory companies that the scores are supposed to be recorded in LA. Uh -huh. um, yeah. It's uh it's difficult. I know now we've been uh uh those of us from Local 47 are out on the uh picket line with the writers guild. Oh. Yeah. The unions good. are supporting each other. That's good. I mean, yeah. honestly, I guess there's always got to be a balance and there's got to be some give and yeah. take. Mm -hmm. And I guess you just have to be aware of what's going on. Sure. You know, and, and willing to negotiate and adjust things as needed. Like I know, like for example, um, 
with SAG, yeah, Screen Actors Guild. Yep. Um, they've made it a lot easier to do independent stuff now. Yeah. Like, um, That's what I've heard. for a while, I was trying. I would try to pitch my my. I have a really low budget uh, Star Trek um, fan series that I do, but it's really good. Yeah. But even though it's super low budget because of nowadays of the software and everything. But anyways, sure. for a while I was trying to get some Star Trek actors and I had a few that were pretty interested, but they were like, well, we got to get it. We got to do all this paperwork through SAG. And, uh, and I was sure. like, forget it. I'm not even going to try that. But then um, I found out they have this new thing called a micro budget project that anything that's less than $20,000 Oh, wow. Can do. And so I just, I was, I was like, okay, I'll, try, I'll go online and fill out the online form and see uh -huh. what happens. Mm -hmm. And amazingly, an hour after I filled on the, out the form, it was approved. Wow. <laughs> so now Great. I can suddenly have yeah. SAG actors on my show. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the cool thing also is, I mean, um, I also found out that the rates, I was giving a small stipend. I thought it was a small stipend. For a couple hours of work, I was paying people like a hundred dollars for one mm -hmm. to two hours with the work, and I thought that was like peanuts. But then I found out, well, that's actually a pretty good rate because people there's people that work for a couple hundred bucks for an entire day. Wow! You know, so because I guess the SAG rates are based on daily rates, mm -hmm. and um, but all my stuff is done through green screen, so I can just do it in a short session. And not ah. have all this waiting around time trying to get all the lighting right and not oh, you know, yeah. have to worry about catering and all that crap. Yeah, um, sure. Oh, yeah. So no. I'm able to do it really efficiently. Mm -hmm. for, so I can still do a small budget project, but still pay my actors a decent fee for a few hours of work. So it works out pretty good for me. And I'm mm -hmm. above the board now. I don't have to do any, any kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> nether world sort of backroom deal type of things. Yeah. I can just say, hey, it's all SAG approved. Here's the paperwork. and Oh, yeah. That, so yeah. that's really cool that they, they were able to do that because what I had heard was uh, before that, there were a lot of actors that couldn't get jobs because they wanted to do smaller scale stuff just to do it or they really liked the project. Sure. But they couldn't because it was too low budget and it wasn't SAG approved. Yeah. Now they, they figured out a way to allow these smaller gigs to happen. Mm -hmm. So... Because even the union has, uh, well, they have demo scales, which are much lower, and then they have, um, yeah, low budget, uh, let's see, not micro budget, but they have low budget and, um, yeah, different scales. And then, you know, because things change. I mean, I know years ago, it was like, I mean, now people, um, before it was like, uh, well, now people have websites sites and then um they want to be able to um show their music mm -hmm. um and just things are changing and all that's the how i do streaming I and you know it's just it just keeps changing it's hard to keep up yeah you know, nowadays it's so much i think what it is is that there's so much content now yes that's and so much good content that Ooh. there's there's a lot the, the amount of control over it is not nearly as tight as it used to be. Yes, that's true too. So you don't have to be in the big name, big wig crowds sure. to get anything, have, have a chance to go anywhere with it. True. So now you can have these more indie projects. They'll like, you won't make millions of dollars on it, but you'll at least have your small following, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. and it can get somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, I know that in, in uh, like the uh, lower budget, I think that, well, one of the scales is, <laughs> I remember when I was first starting to do a, um, the uh, some of the uh, lower, low budget films. And I was like, I said to the person, well, there's, you know, union scale, if it's, I think it's, I think, well, that scale was below 2 million. <laughs> they said they made their whole film for like 167,000. That was the overall whole budget. Mm -hmm. And then there was another film I, and it turned out great. And there was another mm. film that I worked on and it was 300 something, 330 for the whole film. Yeah. I and mean, I've seen people make 
Um, I mean, I have filmmaker friends. I mean, it wasn't films I worked on, but I've seen people make films for very, very, very little. Yeah, it's it's. Um, well, I, I know a guy, it's Patrick Fedori. Yeah, it's it's so different now. Yeah, now I know. I just there's a really good film out there. Patrick P Perez Vidori did a film called, um, in other words, it's a romantic comedy oh. for $300,000. Yeah. And it is beautiful. Yeah. The script is great. The acting is amazing. The mm -hmm. cinematography is totally beautiful. Yeah. If you saw the film, you'd think for sure they spent millions of dollars on it, but he did it for 300000 mm -hmm. It's because he was so good. He was such a good actor. He got a really good director of photography. Mm -hmm. He was able to pull in some really good actors. And they just did it. Yep. And so it can people, be done. As people work more and more films, also yep. they build a team. So then they have people they can count on and all. I have yep. a friend of mine back east. I, did, I didn't do music on her film, but she did a whole film. And it took all took place in a van. <laughs> it was cute. It was a short film and, and as a as a um, uh, proof of concept for a feature. And mm -hmm. it came out yep. really great. I, I don't remember what her budget was, but it wasn't much at all. And, um, but uh, yeah, SAG, either, well, I don't remember if that one was either SAG deferred or SAG, um, but SAG uh, uh, compliant, uh, yep. that's not the word, but yeah. But um, yeah, especially some of the people are, are doing, um, now, somebody else the other day was telling me um, they were going to do a film and, and only maybe most of it took place in, in one uh, one seat, uh, one uh, location and maybe, yeah, especially if they don't move around too much. On, yeah. on but I've seen some amazing things done for uh, not a lot of uh, money. And, um, but yeah. Yeah, got, this movie, the one I'm talking about, the thing is, it didn't look low budget at all. It had lots of yeah. on location That's shots. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. And everything was totally top notch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And That's uh, fantastic. what I found out is um, because it was low budget, they didn't mm -hmm. do very many takes. Like they, they were sailing oh, through the script. Yeah. yeah. But th he was just such a good director and he had such good, he knew what he was doing and he had such good actors that they pulled it off. And I bet he um, yeah. really thought ahead and, and planned ahead and knew yeah. you know, what they were going to do. Yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, they didn't have the extra time or, um, yeah, budget to, you know, keep retaking. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, and the music, the soundtrack in it was really good, too. Wow. D did someone write an original score? Or? Um, I think it was a, there was a music director. It had a lot, it was a Latin, it was, oh. it was about... Yeah. Uh, it was in Mexico, so there was a lot of Latin music in it, mm -hmm. and um, so they may they may have uh, been able to get rights for some standing ah, tunes and stuff, or yeah. you know, I don't know exactly how they did it. Uh -huh. um, I'd have to ask him again. Mm -hmm. But sure. um, again, the choices that he picked were I get the director. This Great. was a type of director who really understood music. Great. So mm -hmm. he pit and he he worked with and he had but he also had a guy that was in charge of the music too, of course. But there he was, he knew what he wanted, and he, um, anyways, they had a good thing going. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, yeah, planning and just knowing. And uh, uh, my friend in New York, yeah, was saying that yeah, she had worked with different people, and uh, so she knew uh, some of the different people to bring on and who could work. Um, yeah, they uh, yeah. same vision or um, yeah, familiar with their work, and so it really helped. Um, yeah, I do a lot of repeat of, of working with people that I've worked with before, and so I'll work yep. with them again. So that's true too. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we should wrap it up. Um, okay. So you are a Star Trekky, right? Sure. So I can do my live long and prosper with you. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All right, Bonnie. <laughs> So yeah, it's been great it's talking pleasure. to you and to live yes. long and prosper. And do you watch the Orville too? Uh, I ha uh, only a little bit. Yeah, I should catch that more. The music in the Orville is really good too, especially oh, yeah. third season. Oh uh, uh, I forgot who did. Uh, I can't think now who does the music for that. But that's it's a different that's guy Harley, for the third right? season. Yeah, they, they really like jab Harley. the third. Okay. The music for the third season is especially cinematic. It's really ah. they put a lot into it. 
Because mm-hmm. Seth MacFarlane is, I don't know if you know this, but he's a really fa- great musician. He's yeah, because I, voice. I have friends of mine that have worked with him. Yeah. And in fact, I think his fellow Ron Jones, I think that he's, I think he scored a lot of, yeah, I think he scored a bit. Uh, but he kind of semi-retired, moved back up. Actually, he's living somewhere outside Seattle. He's up in Washington, where he oh, really? I should, came oh, from. That's interesting. So a couple of years ago, he he left LA, but um, yeah, Seth uh, was the cool Farland, thing for yeah. the cool thing for the Orville is he yeah. really wanted to use uh, orchestral scores and real, not synthesized, yeah. but real orchestras. And then um, they did this really cool episode where they did some kind of party in the shuttle bay uh-huh. that was going to have an orchestra. Mm-hmm. So they used the the real orchestra, the people that are actually in sure. the, the, the orchestra. They, they brought them into the set and they were all the extras. Yeah. Actually played. Cool. So it's called sidelining. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So side-lighting. Yeah. So that was really fun. Oh, uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. I know. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of friends of mine have worked with Seth, and I know that, well, pre COVID, he would have live parties and then bring the sa- the bands in that played mm-hmm. on, on his, his other shows. Um, and he probably sang at the yeah. party and stuff. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. There's YouTube yeah, videos out there of him singing like show tunes and stuff. Oh, and it's yeah, not just good, that. it's super good. Like his voice is like yeah. super well trained it's, it's beautiful it's like oh, it's perfect i, I was Very listening really closely and i'm like whoa crap yeah. this guy's voice is like so it's really really good and he so. treats yeah I, i'm told that he treats the musicians very well and yeah, yeah always players on on the uh, on the scores all of his projects uh, yep. yep and he, he brings it in yeah, like there's a character in in the orville that's the son of the doctor and the kid is, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. And okay. they they worked it into the script that he learns how to play the piano. And, and they he plays piano in the show. Oh, interesting. Like, and they, was, they had like, you know, one of the bridge crew members got up and sang for this party. And they had oh. the kid accompanying him on piano. Oh, wow. They do stuff like That's that. It's really cool. Is it is it his mom that's the doctor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then the other thing, surprisingly, the guy who's like the engineer, um, Jay Lee, and John Lamar is the character's name. Mm-hmm. Well, Jay Lee in real life is a super good classical pianist. Oh wow! And um, but for some reason they haven't shown off any of his piano skills in the show yet. I don't understand why not because they've got him oh, too. They so, should because he can They're like he can play Chopin etudes and all his stuff really well. Oh wow! I've heard him play live and he was like nailing everything. Oh. He was playing all kinds of Chopin and he played one of them that's wow. apparently is one of the hardest ones of them all. Wow! And he played Maybe. it really well. Wow! And, uh, like the it was the recital was basically Chopin. Uh-huh. WC, and then uh, there was a little bit of Hinostera in there too. But surprisingly, oh. he didn't play any Beethoven or Mozart or Haydn or anything. It was just all oh. romantic, romantic and impressionistic stuff. Ah. Uh, mm. But it was a full length sure. recital, and they were all really hard pieces. And he, his technique was great, and his musicality I really liked. Like, I thought it was just really well Washington, thought out. In your neck of the woods? What's that? Was it in your neck of the woods? Was it in your neck of the woods up in? No, it was in L.A. Oh, he put on a he put on two recitals a couple of years ago. Um, it was at that that art center in the historical district that looks like a fortress. It's got like walls twelve feet high all around it. Uh, was it in? Was it in Beverly Hills, Greystone Manor? No, probably no. Not. It's in the, what's called the historical district, which is like near the uh, the Latino district. Yeah. That's a, from oh, what I, what I remember. Uh, yeah, and it's called downtown, like the, uh, um, I can't remember what it was called, but um, old, it's it's oh, some kind of art center. It had a really it had a really nice um, uh, recital hall, oh. quite intimate. I think it held maybe a hundred people. 
Oh, okay. So it's not, yeah, I was thinking there's, all, well, there's Colburn School, but right near Disney Hall, but yeah, um, yeah, I can't think of what it is now, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was kind of a shady neighborhood, to tell you the truth. So, that, I mean, there was like homeless people on the street half a block away and stuff. That's why, but so the, the place was super high security. It had like a gate and really wow. high walls and stuff like that. Thank you, high walls. And, but anyways, but yeah. it was really fun recital because, I mean, there were a bunch of people from the Orville cast there, including Penny Johnson, who plays the doctor. She was there. Ah. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, Jay Lee, who's on the show. And um, Ann Winters was there. She played, she had a big role in season three as uh, Charlie. Mm. And um, so it was also ended up sort of being sort of a VIP meet and greet thing. If, oh. Just by accident because he invited a bunch of his Orville friends to come and hear his recital. Oh, yeah. And his mom, his, his mom and his dad were there. Oh. His mom was a piano cool. teacher too, and he had her come up at the end, and they played a duet together. Oh wow, that that's was really cool. sweet. That's priceless. That's cool. yeah. So, anyways, what is his name again? His piano? name is Jay Lee. Oh. That's what that's what he goes by. Oh, Jay Lee actor, I guess. Yeah, Jay Lee actor. He plays John Lamar on on uh, the Orville. Oh. I think on on Twitter he's Jay Lee filmmaker, or I think it's just at Jay Lee. Okay, J Y L E E. Yeah. Yeah. Is looking for Alaska known for the? Is this? He does. Um, he also is an independent independent filmmaker. He's done a n number of indie films of his own. Oh. And then he also did this thing called the. It was like the Do Better University or something like that. Sort of a, a self help motivation type of workshop thing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, okay. Actually, there. Okay, there were multiple Jay Lees. Uh, oh, does he play Lieutenant Commander John M Lamar? Yeah, that's him. Oh, okay. I first had the wrong Jay Lee. And if ah. you find him, now, now you can right find. Right. Yeah. On oh, his yeah. YouTube channel, there's some clip. There's a few clips from that recital. Where you oh, can hear yeah, that'd be great. In fact, I think that that act that Chopin prelude. I think it's in G minor. Ah, a friend of mine's a, a really good pianist, and he told me that's like one of the hardest of one of them all. So, see, yeah, I'll look him up. Uh, look yeah. Up. It's, uh, Anyhow, first I looked for J A Y, but it's J period Lee. Yeah. Oh yeah. So there's. Wow! Cool. Yeah, that whole crowd. Of course, again, if you're hooked up with Seth MacFarlane, since he's and he's such a good musician and understands it so well that he works it into his shows oh yeah so yeah, yeah. Oh, anyway cool. okay so we got to wrap it up so okay we have what a pleasure live long and prosper this is a lot of fun yes, live long and prosper yeah and i i'm gonna be back on the the table yeah I keep oh wait for you each week. actually i can start doing it because i i we just had our concert on Saturday, so oh, I no longer right. have Thursday so rehearsals. Had, now I remember you have rehearsals on Thursdays. Yeah. So now I can do it again. Oh, cool. Okay. Very cool. And I'll see you online Thursday. Yeah. yeah. All right. Take care. Live long and prosper. Peace and Live love. Live long and prosper, for and sure. And I look forward. Next time one of your projects comes out, send okay. me an email or something so I can, I'll can. i watch the movie and I'll, I'll say, that's, that's Bonnie's music right there. Okay, you got it. Sounds good. All Take right. Take care. Take care. All right. Bye. From Kosh Production. Fantastic creations emerging spontaneously from the space of life. For the benefit of all beings everywhere. We gotta change.